Hello there. I'm Black Bright, as you probably know. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for sharing and thank you for liking. Um, today I decided to talk about the claimant's commitment. Um, it's the um, commitment, it's the rebranding of the job seekers agreement. It's, a, it's become a more legal document, more confining, more binding. And it's applicable to all of those in the Universal Credit Pathfinders group, but it does go outside that remit. Anyway, um, this is one of those I'm going to have to read, I'm afraid, because of its technicality. And um, yeah, I think it's important that for those of you who are signing on for the first time, what you will need to do and what it entails. Um, you know, when you go in, they're just going to say, listen, um, we are going to help you find work and we're going to um, make sure that you get income more than what, well, what, what was that term they used? Ah, ah what did it say? Oh, uh, we're going to encourage you to get better paid work. Now, if you think of that, that term you have to think, well, better paid work. If you're not earning anything, then anything is better paid, including those zero hours. So you've got to be extremely careful of the subtleties of the conversation, the text and what's being written. OK, so um, the in order to get Job Seekers Allowance, Universal Credit Contribution based the new style, it's called NBNS. Um, you have to sign the claimant commitment document. It's a contract between the Department of Work and Pensions and the claimant, which could be you. Um, and if you if you breach any of it, you're going to be subject to the appropriate sanctions. And you can't say that you don't know what they are because that we, during this um, interview that they give you, they're going to make sure that you understand exactly what you're signing and exactly what the consequences are. So you can't say, oh, I didn't understand, I didn't know, down the line. So you have to go in there with trepidation, with wit, with knowledge, and with patience. Don't rush. Okay. The um, First of all, the claimant commitment is meant to be the best route out of poverty. Now, we all know that's not true because there's so many people who are homeless, destitute, and on the street. So it's not working in that arena. An escape from benefit dependence. Now, I don't see how they can escape from benefit dependence if they're being sanctioned left, right and center when they don't um, do one tiny thing on the form. I mean, technically, providing they've shown um, the, they've used their best endeavors to get a job which is the legal requirement. They shouldn't be penalised and sanctioned if they didn't um, look up a job on one day. Um, so, yeah, so an escape from benefit dependence? I don't think so, because if you're sanctioned, that means you're going to have to depend on another benefit from some other place. If it's not from the Department of Work and Pensions, you're going to have to probably go to your local council. So that defeats that object. Per personalised approach to the labour market. Personalised approach to the labour market. I guess that's supposed to mean that if you say you're going to, um, you want work as a carpenter, they are going to look for a carpenter job and they're going to go through all of their, um, their job applications to see if they can find it a job just for you, regardless of how much it pays and regardless of where it is, um, I think the criteria is that it's a job match, i.e. they can match the job with your skills. Um, take responsibility for themselves and prepare for work. Well, this is what this claimant commitment is supposed to do. It's supposed to help you take responsibility for yourself. How can you take responsibility for yourself on a pittance when it's not enough money? When they're roping you into debt before you even get it by making you wait weeks and weeks and weeks. How is that showing you how to take responsibility for yourself? 
And I, like I said earlier, it's supposed to uh, make you take up better paid work. And like I said, anything above a zero hour contract is better paid, according to them, not to us. Um, it's supposed to make families become more independent. How does it do that when they penalise one member of the family because of another? You know, one member of the family um, doesn't want to sign, then the other one gets penalised. So how is that creating more independent families? And it simplifies the benefit system. Oh, yeah, well, it does that easy enough or everything, one payment. And everything, every element of that payment has a condition. OK, so that's the first part. Accepting the claimant commitment is a condition of entitlement, which means, like I said, if you don't sign it, you don't get any of the benefits. Um, requirements and consequences are set out in one place. So all of the requirements and all of the consequent all of the consequences, if you don't adhere to what it says, and what you've signed up to are in one document. It is a contract between the Department of Work and Pensions and the claimant. Well, that's clear. You cannot claim job seekers allowance, universal credit or contributions based new start unless they have signed a current agreed claimant commitment. So we know that um, the claimant commitment must this is what's going to be stipulated in the in the agreement. Detailed claimants work preparation requirements. So they're going to tell you how to prepare for work. Um, detailed claimants work search requirements. So they're going to tell you how, what the requirements are to search for work. Um, detailed claimants work availability requirements. Well, I guess the claimant will have to tell them when they're going to be available. And if they're not available, why aren't they available? If you're not working, why aren't you available 24-7? I'm just throwing it out there. Um, <clears throat> what other work-related activities do you have? This is all in the agreement, you know. So... Um, supposing that's probably how they get around why you might not be available. They want to make sure you're not doing any other work. If you are doing other work, it falls under that criteria where they reduce your universal credit to compensate for the work. I think it's 60p in a pound over a certain amount. Um, they'll ask you to explain the consequences of failing to comply with work-related requirements. That's what I said before, to make sure you understand, you know what you're signing. You can't say, oh boy, I'm never know said. It did say that. Okay, be reviewed regularly and updated as required. Okay, so what else have we got here? Um, if one member of a couple does not accept their claimant's commitment, neither will be entitled to universal credit if they apply as a couple. I guess if they apply individually, that of course won't apply. Claimant commitment can be accepted by phone or in writing or in person in a work search interview. I'm sure they prefer the work search interview though, because they're going to say, why can't you come in? What are you doing while you can't come in? The advisor will discuss the regime for work search. The regime, you know, for work search. You know what regime is? That sounds really, that's like when you're in the army and you have to have a certain regime, exactly what you're going to do, day by day, hour by hour. So you have to make sure you don't overcommit. You have to make sure that that regi regime is within your capacity. Because once you sign it, that's it. They allow you to reconsider once after you've signed it. But that's it. You can't reconsider it again. Um, well, technically you can, but you'd have to reapply. And you know that's like another six to how many months it takes for them to approve it in the first place. So that's like a deterrent saying to you, well, you better know what you're signing up for. So you have to make sure that whatever you agree to is within your ability to comply. Um, yeah, so make sure it's feasible. The claimant has seven days cooling off period. So suppose you go there and you think, oh, I don't know about this. I don't really want to sign this claimant commitment 
not really feeling it. You've got seven days uh, to, you know, it's like a contract, any other contract that they do online. You've got seven days, not 14 days, to rethink. At the end of seven days, if you've decided that you don't want to sign it, um, they close the account, they close the case. And if you, you can't kind of change your mind after that, they can't reopen it after the seven days, and that includes weekends, you will have to start all over again. Okay, now if you've reconsidered, say after two to three days within the cooling period, they will then have to take that to their senior and have a little discussion. And they can either, I mean, when you're reconsidering, you're more or less saying, oh, I'm, I'm not going to devote um, 40 hours a week to job search. I think 20 hours a week is reasonable. Now, they're going to take that back to their manager or whatever, have a discussion, and they may or may not agree. If they don't agree, they close the account and you have to reapply. So just make sure whatever you agree to, you agree to it properly from the beginning. Um, what else? Um, reconsider work-related requirements. Can only reconsider work-related requirements once. I just said that, didn't I? Um new claims so know what you agree up front oh yeah i've already said that um yeah so that's basically what the job seeker oblique claimant commitment is i highlighted something here that um was sent to me from uh who was it i'll tell you who it was www.whatdotheyknow.co.uk and um, they said the basic rule with agreements is that the employment officer needs to be satisfied that if the claimant were to comply with its content, then that would mean the claimant was available for an actively seeking work. The agreement sets out a list of activities the claimant will perform mm. um, to look for work. However, the test of whether a claimant is actively seeking work is not that the claimant must perform the activities contained in the agreement or commitment. A claimant is not required to take those steps for finding work set out in the agreement in order to count for actively seeking work. But where a claimant does not do the things set out in the agreement or does not look for the type of work set out in their agreement, it is likely that they may not be regarded as actively seeking work. So in other words, yeah, you can do what you like. Basically, they're saying you can do this agreement and you can say, OK, um, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to look for that job. I'm going to sleep in on Saturday. But what it means is you're not going to get the benefit. You're not going to get the universal credit. So you're actually wasting your time. You've given them access to all of your business and you're just not going to do anything that's going to benefit you. So just make sure that, you know, if you do, um, if you do need the money desperately, make sure you know what you're committing to and make sure you do what you've committed to. Because otherwise it's going to be, you're going to be up the creek with that paddle. Um, let me see what else I highlighted here. Ah, what is this saying? The law imposes a test that asks what the claimant did. They looked at what C did not do, not what he did do. OK, there was one that went to an appeal. And what what the outcome was is that um, the person who they called C they stopped his money and even though he'd shown that he had been actively seeking work all they were doing was picking out the negatives the things that he hadn't done you know like i said in that earlier video um if you've done 40 400 40 hours um searching one day and 20 in the next day and you left out the wednesday and then you did um 30 hours on the thursday and they pick out the wednesday they're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to look at not what you haven't done. They're supposed to look at what you have done. 
But once again, all of these things, if you're trying to pursue it, it's going to cost you money, which you don't have. And that's why they get away with it. Uh, what else? A person shall be expected to have to take more than two steps in any week unless taking one or two steps is all that is reasonable for that person to do in that week. Well, I guess what that means is that if you've agreed to take two steps and then um, but in the, in the contract, it says you've got to take five steps. Um, if it's reasonable for you to take two to three steps, that is what should be accepted. But this don't take my word for it. This is um, something I think they were going to some kind of appeal. And these are the points that they were pointing out. Yeah, so I'm not really going to go into that because it's all very technical. But needless to say, if you are claiming for the first time, you are going to feel, you know, they do make you feel a bit like a failure. They do make you feel all of those things that you don't like and what you probably called other people. You know, it's it's not nice. Drain on resources and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it there for now. And I hope you found it helpful. Bye-bye.